Well, it was very interesting to hear all of your perspectives a little bit earlier on before my talk, because I think this is going to be pretty polarizing um, in a lot of ways. So now I'm even more excited to present this topic. So uh, I watched the movie The Fountain, and I mainly utilized it as a means, as a platform to discuss my own, I guess, agenda, my own things that I'm interested in, in the context of life extension and immortality more broadly. And so then I'll start off very briefly mentioning my, uh, my thoughts on the fountain, and then we we'll move on to the science, and then two segments on some arguments, the philosophy surrounding immortality in support or against it. And then again, there are three objectives that I'm really looking forward to being able to hopefully convey, uh, being a recap of what movies and popular culture tend towards kind of putting forward with their, their storytelling, and then uh, also a, uh, a bit more of an open-minded perspective on potentially the optimistic side of technologically enabled biological immortality. And then, as I said previously, mentioning some perspectives that also acknowledge but challenge traditional philosophical narratives associated with this topic. So, the first segment. Uh, the Fountain. Uh, it's pretty much a typical story of a, how media tends to represent the pursuit of immortality um, as a futile endeavour as uh, something that at best will result in piercing dissatisfaction of the characters or at worst that inevitable annihilation. You know, whether it's <clears throat> the old guard, altered carbon, the age of Adeline, as we saw before, um, walking this fine line of immortality is almost always represented negatively. Um, and yet again, this movie is a similar story in that kind of way. So. We follow the main character, uh, Tom. I will refer to him collectively because it's actually across three different time frames, uh, 1500, 2000, and 2500, with the same uh, coupling as well. So he is in love with Izzy, or Isabella, or potentially the tree of life in this movie. Um, as it seems to be implied um, when it bounces back and forth between these three dynamic time frames. Uh, it can be a little bit tough to keep track sometimes, uh, but nonetheless, uh, the main motivations for the main character, Tom, was of curing his wife of brain cancer. <clears throat> and so then in that kind of process, he uh, definitely put himself across uh, all into it, all of his desires, all of his intentions were into that. Um, but as the movie progresses along, then it starts to broaden um, as the main component, the 2000 era, uh, he was a scientist. And so he's trying to kind of develop these treatments and these things to be able to cure that. Um, but I won't, I won't spoil the movie for you in that kind of way, um, at least not yet. So, um, unfortunately, there was limited amount of kind of scientific uh, explanation to what they were doing in the movie. But as much as you could see, they were doing testing um, of potential treatments for the brain tumor in macaque monkeys, um, a, a typical subject in this kind of context. Um, and then they were trying to test these tree barks that were kind of combined in some kind of way with another unnamed, assumably, standard substance that will hopefully be going towards curing of the cancer, but also aging as well. Um, so then I actually did some research into this and found that there are certain bark extracts and biosynthesized metallic nanoparticles using bark extracts um, that have actually been documented in the real world to have at least some validity with respect to cancer, um, whereas there hasn't been much to show in the context of anti-aging apart from the more kind of superficial aspects of, you know, cosmetic products. But one of the things that I think is most interesting about this kind of topic, this kind of movie, is that whether it's the fable of Gilgamesh or 
whose quest for immortality falls short as he fails two of the gods' tests and therefore is not granted immortality, only to realize that a mortal's version of immortality is in the lasting works of civilization and culture that are left behind after our mortal bodies inevitably perish. Or it is the various religiously related stories of how the soul is reabsorbed to a higher or different plane of existence where we will live for eternity in either pleasure or pain, depending upon our choices in this current life. Um, or even just the quest for the Holy Grail. All of these having the end goal of at attaining some kind of ideal of immortality in one way or another. In the case of this movie, it's the same shown in many traditional, <clears throat> many traditional stories around the world. But such intangible hopes are not supported by any kind of evidence, nor do they present a plausible path towards going about achieving it. Now, for the second part, the science. Uh, a lot can be said for what is shown in science fiction, but what can actually be done with respect to our own aging? Well, there's been some work done by a few prominent researchers uh, that have elucid elucidated a potential path forward. Starting with the biggest contender uh, for a potential methodology towards indefinite lifespan. And yes, in this context, I'm including health span inside this broad topic of lifespan, so you can take it as a colloquial equivalence. He calls this approach comprehensive cellular maintenance. Now, the idea behind this is to say that humans are similar to cars. In the case behind aging is one of physics more so than of biology, meaning that with proper care and consideration to maintain the component pieces in the correct ways, it will result in the continued functioning of the entire system. But before I get ahead of myself, uh, this is one of the uh, first pieces of research that he released that kind of got this whole movement of people interested in this area. Um, so he discovered that there was fundamentally only seven major forms of cellular decay or degradation over time that contribute towards what we define as aging. And these were very creatively named the seven deadly things. Um, as you can see, there is a... Uh, there is a maintenance approach for each of these different damage types um, and as it looks increasingly unlikely that there is evidence for an eighth kind at least with respect to this model and i don't know if you're like me but i definitely prefer to simplify things where i can and so i found this and i thought this was quite kind of a convenient way to convey the most important parts of the information as compared to getting too wrapped up in the terminology So Aubrey's approach uh, here has been like the intersection between the two more traditional fields of gerontology and geriatrics. Um, gerontology being that scientific study of old age, the process of aging, um, and the particular problems of old people. Um, and then geriatrics, that being the branch of medicine or social science dealing with the health and care of old people. In this intersection, Engineering the accumulated damage uh, appeared to be a possible solution to many of the problems in both these fields, albeit indirectly. As gerontology is concerned with the extraordinarily complex cellular metabolism and geriatricians are involved in the pathologies that are already present in elderly people, um, these almost insurmount insurmountable tasks can almost be sidestepped in a certain way. However, later research in 2013 then made a finer distinction and provided nine mechanisms of what they called the hallmarks of aging to the mix. Um, these provided another perspective of a potential pathway towards life extension. And as we can see here, they also suggested, uh, as with the previous research, potential solutions to each of these problem areas. I'll, I would like to add at this point, unfortunately, because I don't have a uh, infinite amount of time, I will only be able to go pretty superficially across a lot of the topics that I am wanting to discuss in this presentation. Um, however, the difference with this presentation, this uh, study, was that they were able to present findings that these were interconnected, um, these different uh, hallmarks. So as we can see, there are primary hallmarks that cause damage, antagonistic hallmarks that respond to that damage, and then integrative hallmarks that, which ultimately contribute to the clinical effects of aging as seen in physiological loss of reserve, organ decline, and reduced function. 
Now, here are some real world uh, examples of the progress being made. Um, as there is quite a lot, um, I won't put you through uh, talking about each and every single one of these, but just to skim over them, uh, these are representing these different areas, these different hallmarks and the different uh, drugs or the different companies or institutes that are actually working on potential solutions and the stage at which they are at with that research. So as you can see, there is quite a lot of research being done for each of these areas. Um, and uh, I mainly list these just to make the point that there are solutions that are already in the works and that are either in you know, late stage clinical trials or have been released to show the viability of this. But something very interesting happened quite recently in August actually of this year. Uh, there was another team of researchers that proposed five more hallmarks of aging to add to this already well-established model. Um, and again, I include this to show that there seems to be significant forward motion that is becoming more and more common as it seems more and more feasible to more people, um, effectively causing a positive spiral of more research resulting in more research and therefore progress. But I'll close out this section with a quote from the man himself. The right to choose to live or to die is the most fundamental right there is. Conversely, the duty to give others that opportunity to the best of our ability is the most fundamental duty there is. Now, on to the more philosophical segment of this presentation. We'll begin with the most common objection to life extension more broadly, which is that of overpopulation. But I would like to open this with actually a thought experiment by a guy named Max Moore. He says, let us assume for a moment that population growth is or will become a serious problem. Would this give us a strong reason for turning against the extension of human lifespan? No. Opposing extended life because it might add to existing problems would be an unethical response. Suppose you're a doctor given a child to treat who is suffering from pneumonia. Would you refuse to cure the child and skin her knees? <laughs> Sorry. Would you, <laughs> would you refuse to cure the child because she would be well enough to run around, fall down and skin her knees? Or our first responsibility is to live long and vitally and to help others to do the same. Once we're at work on the primary goal, we can focus more on solving other challenges. Life extension and optimal living for the individual certainly benefits from a healthy physical and social environment. The life extensionist may want to be part of the solution to any population issues, but dying is not a responsible or healthy way to solve anything. Besides, if we take seriously the idea of limiting lifespan to control population, why not be more active about it? Why not encourage suicide? Why not execute anyone reaching the age of 75? Now, the basis for an overpopulated planet being a threat as a result of life extension is a misguided one, as overpopulation is primarily a function of fertility rates, not longevity rates. In other words, the population growth rate is determined by how many children are born, not how long we live necessarily. Even if there is a population problem, extending the human lifespan will worsen the problem no more than improving automobile safety or worker safety or reducing violent crime. Who would want to keep these deadly threats high in order to combat population growth? The situation seems to be simply trading up to a better set of problems. Uh, need to be more conscious of reducing births, not on raising or maintaining deaths in order to keep the population stable. Let alone the prospect of creating new habitats in space at some point in the future, therefore alleviating some of the pressures of population control on Earth even more. And while I'm not able to prove this, um, that this would not be the case, um, I find that it would be difficult to agree to the notion that simply uh, existing for a long time would make someone tired of, of continuing that existence. And while this is not to say that in a world where there would be immortal individuals, um, that depression rates would fall to absolute zero um, once that was achieved, um, it's however to say that depression would not be an inevitability either, in my view. 
But then, well, at the very least, an argument might be made that even if you're not actively looking to end your life at some future point um, in time due to depression or otherwise, then you would at least get quite bored. Um, and that is funny because of the amount of conversation it seems like we've had in this class about that so far. Um, or that at least there would be some kind of apathy um, that would be an unideal way to live. But I would also challenge this notion um, of inevitability as false. Um, this is simply a matter of perspective, I feel, um, and it's one of being creative enough to feel the content, uh, feel content with the decisions to participate in voluntary activities in each moment or not, um, whether this is on a micro or infinite time frame. It's the same decision, it's just repeated. But is the, the prospect of immortal dictators? Well, I would open with the question, is there the prospect of mortal dictators currently? I would say yes, of course. Um, once everyone has the option of immortality, is there then the prospect of immortal dictators in the future? Well, that would then be yes. Um, the argument against life extension due to the potential existence of immortal dictators as a result I feel is insignificant, uh, insufficient, um, as it's simply uh, one of the traded sacrifices that comes along with the new set of problems that would be encountered. And therefore, it's not strong enough alone to suggest that life extension should not be pursued. The problem is with dictators, not with extending life. But let's take the example of actually the movie In Time of resource hoarding. And in that kind of context, uh, it's, I was going to explain briefly what the movie was about, but thankfully that's already been done for me. Um, so then, uh, is there the prospect of resource hoarding currently? Yes. Once everyone has the option for immortality, is there the prospect of resource hoarding again? In this case, time uh, being hoarded in the future. Well, yes. Um, especially with respect to the kinds of life extension expressed here. But yet again, I don't believe that is sufficient to suggest that the concept of life extension is a bad idea in of itself. Now I hear this um, a little bit in my kind of conversations with people about this, that life extension is unnatural. Why would you want to extend past your natural lifespan or the median lifespan or what you're expecting to be able to live and I would argue that being anti-life extension is in fact being anti-medicine because any use of medicine is in fact by definition a form of life extension we are using it to resolve an ailment that may result in a shorter or more torturous life so to say that wanting to extend life beyond what may be normal or expected of the time of you being alive is unnatural is to reject medicine as a whole, something that would universally be a foolish idea. Now, Memento Mori, um, one of the most useful pieces of practical philosophy produced by the Stoics um, that is able to harness our focus and position ourselves on a trajectory of doing the things that we should be doing as compared to wasting time, you know, as can be common when we forget the nature of our current morality. Um, an argument for not wanting to eradicate aging um, is that it gives our lives a sense of urgency. Um, and if we were to have an infinite amount of time to do the things we wanted to do, we just simply wouldn't be able to do them. Um, we simply wouldn't do them and instead procrastinate on them indefinitely because we'd be able to instead just do that sometime in the future, so why do them right now? However, I also reject this notion, as you probably could tell, um, as it misses a very crucial component of living a good life. Doing things that interest, excite, and challenge you on a regular day-to-day -day basis. To assume that we would somehow no longer need this kind of simulation is misinformed. All this would allow us to do to, is to freedom, the freedom to pursue things without the need of sacrificing certain interests, as we will inevitably have the time to participate in them. When we were, sat when we were satisfied enough with them, then uh, we are able to move on and, and work on something else. 
that we are interested in at that time point. Now, we'll move on to the arguments for immortality. And we'll begin with something that people can tend to forget in these kinds of discussions. That aging represents the root cause of many severe diseases, such as cancer, Alzheimer's, stroke, Parkinson's, heart disease, COPD, type 2 diabetes, osteoarthritis, and atherosclerosis, or heart disease, a kind of heart disease, um, leading to disability of the elderly and to a wide range of negative social consequences, which makes it the perfect target for the global healthcare system. These diseases can only be cured if the actual aging processes are directly addressed and halted while the damage is repaired or reversed by medical interventions. Um, therefore, according to the WHO and the United Nations policy, this means that global society has an obligation to eventually cancel aging in order to achieve the highest possible level of health for all people. Now, one of the facts from a 2007 CDC report in America uh, stated the state of aging and health in America that providing healthcare for an older American costs three to five times more than for an individual under 65. As the population ages, the nation's healthcare spending is projected to increase 25% by 2030. Now, the economic value of delayed aging, at least in the US, has been estimated to be approximately $7.1 trillion over 50 years for those, under fi for those over 50 with some estimates stretching it up to 21 trillion US dollars, um, which shows that there is not just a subjective benefit to life extension, but also an objective one uh, in terms of economic metrics that contribute to the value of this kind of development. Pardon me. Uh, these statistics are significant, let alone the economic output um, that would be able to put back into the economy as a result of having more individuals that are capable of contributing towards it therefore contributing and generating more money from both fronts to be put into the important projects for the rest of society. As it stands, the contributions of the elderly are estimated to be approximately, again in the US, uh, about $8 trillion each year. Now consider how much that number would increase due to the increased ability and productivity from not suffering from the ravages of aging. But what if we were to consider aging as a disease itself. There are many researchers emerging in the world that are starting to publicly hold this view of aging being considered as a disease. However, this perspective is not without its opponents. One of the biggest proponents of this idea is David Sinclair, a geneticist at Harvard Medical School who argues that we should view aging not as a natural consequence of growing older, but as a condition in and of itself. In his view, uh, it's simply a pathology, and like all pathologies, can be successfully treated. He's been quoted as saying that many of the most serious diseases today are a function of aging, thus identifying the molecular mechanisms and treating of aging should be an urgent priority. He goes on to say, unless we address aging at its root cause, we're not going to continue our linear upward progress towards longer and longer lifespans. Some even argue that aging population is the climate change of healthcare with the suppression with the suggestion that the future may include not just geoengineering but geroengineering um, now there is actually a very interesting theory proposed by uh, a couple of gentlemen called terror management theory um, and a brief summary of it um, with respect to time uh, is that the awareness of death engenders potentially debilitating um, terror that is managed by the development and maintenance of cultural worldviews, um, which obviously makes it understandable why we can uh, hold the views that we do. And now, quickly to run over, pardon me, um, quickly to run over um, the thought process that might occur in this process to make this make sense is one, you start with a death related thought, um, it just enters somehow through your awareness. Then your proximal, the second is your proximal defenses such as suppression or rationalization are used. The third step is an increase in death-related thoughts outside of awareness. Step four is a distal terror management defense, i.e. worldview defense and self-esteem bolstering are used. And the fifth stage 
is death-related thoughts outside awareness are reduced and potential terror is averted. Now, with this thought process elucidated, we can see how effective these strategies are to help us maintain the status quo and prevent us from uh, flipping out pretty much on, uh, on the likelihood of our own deaths. Um, but if we are to recognize that one of the only reasons we hold the views that we currently do about aging, um, then we can see that our kind of monkey brains are just kind of coping with the situation that we can't control. But uh, our pursuit towards greater complexity, greater organization, and the taming of our internal and external environments um, is in large part what makes us an advanced species and is in large part what has made us to be the kind of humans that we find ourselves to be now. Um, without our insatiable desire to progress and develop better and better lives for humans through technological advancement, we would not be the kind of species that we currently are. Some may argue that this is an evolutionary flaw, um, lending us to be harder to satisfy and experience contentment, but I would argue that only so much stagnation should be tolerated regardless, as we would have otherwise remained in a state that is not conducive for experiencing the higher levels of self-actualization needed to fulfill our potential as thinking apes. Um, to adapt, improvise, and overcome in spectacular and almost magical ways is one very important component of being human, in my perspective. But now, my final point, um, before I close things out, uh, I really like this YouTuber, CGP Grey, um, and he has a video um, on, on being uh, immortal and kind of the reasons why uh, it seems to be so strange that humans are uh, so happily accepting of it. Um, and so I, I scraped a couple of points that he made and I really wanted to share them um, here. So he starts off by saying, like a, like a hostage who grows to love their kidnapper, um, it is the greatest Stockholm syndrome of life to see death as integral. Death is a part of life. Death gives life meaning. These are two very common statements, both which are ridiculous. Um, misery doesn't give happiness meaning. Happiness is meaning itself. If you tortured people to make them better appreciate life, then you would be a monster, not the saint you may feel yourself to be under this ideology. We believe the lie that the horrors we can't avoid are good for us. While death is technically a part of life, cholera was also a part of life at one point until humans developed wells and sewers to separate water from waste. Short-sightedness is a part of life until it isn't. Just because a thing is natural does not make it good or necessary. It's natural to live lives nasty, brutish, and short. And it's natural for humans to look at what indifferent nature provides us as a starting point, as a to-do list, where humans focus technology ever improves. And with that, the ability to make lives better ever improves. Brains need to be cleared of this death acceptance. Death is not a solution to future problems imagined. Faced with the ch changes that longer lives will bring, humans will not miss the reaper and construct one to solve their problems. Just as with our larger cities, we don't remix the water and the waste to bring back cholera. Humans must discard this learned helplessness the reaper and their own brains have imposed on them to instead see the rot and decay not as natural and inevitable, but as a degenerative disease to be attacked like all the others, as the degenerative disease that affects 100% of the population and is a source of misery untold. So now to close, I'll share with you two of my favorite quotes from Alan Harrington. We must never forget that we are cosmic revolutionaries, not stooges conscripted to advance a natural order that kills everybody. The philosophy that accepts death must be considered dead itself. Its questions meaningless, its consolations worn out. Thank you. <laughs>